Good morning. It's great to see you all here today, First Christian Church. Uh, just a few announcements before we get started. I wanted to uh, remind you all that we have a wedding shower today for Kaylee Jackson. It's today at 2 o'clock. And one of the things we're going to do is create a scrapbook of our favorite scriptures. And so Jennifer's holding one of the sheets up right now. Um, so Damon also has some to pass out. If you want to pass a few of them out, those who are interested. And you can bring those cards along with you to the wedding shower today. Also, I just want to remind everyone to fill out the friendship registers, whether you are new or a returning regular attendee. Um, we'd really appreciate it if everybody could fill out the registers. Are there any other announcements? Okay. Oh, yes, sorry, Jennifer. Uh, the congregational care um, class and Reverend Robert Caton, we are having um, the Bible study this afternoon at 5 o'clock. And we just wanted to remind everybody about that. Thank you. Okay, if there's no other announcements, then stand as you are able for our opening hymn. Dear Lord, as we gather today for worship during this Lenten season, as we reflect upon your sacrifice for us, Lord, help us to know you in every breath, in every hope, in every relationship. Meet us here today and teach us to recognize the covenant of justice, peace, and love you have written on our hearts. May you, our desires align with your desires, our work become your work, and our community, the place where you are sought and found. In your precious name, amen. Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel according to St. John. We'll be reading from chapter 11, beginning in verse 28, but I want to share with you a couple of words that will help give us a sense of the context. Many of you are familiar with the story of the raising of Lazarus, and this passage actually begins in verse 1, so for time's sake, I trimmed off the first 27 
verses, but we do need just a word about some of the context. Martha has gone out to Jesus, and they've had a discussion about Jesus' identity. They've had a discussion about the circumstances that are emotionally overwhelming for Martha and Mary and all those who loved Lazarus. And she makes a confession of faith. Jesus points out to her that in him, he is the resurrection and the life. And she goes on to acknowledge that he is the Christ, the Son of God, the one sent into the world. And she has just made this confession of faith when we pick up in verse 28. So I call your attention there at this time. When Martha had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were in the house, who were with her in the house consoling her, saw Mary get up and go out quickly. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. weep. There's another translation that says it in two words only, Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. May our lives be transformed by the reading and hearing of these words. Amen. We are all on this journey during this Lenten season where we are in the process of transformation and becoming and part of the process for all of us. We are more or less, uh, have made our way more or less on this journey, but for all of us it's a process of becoming unbound and becoming free. And one of the ways that we become free, I believe, is through our shared prayers with one another. It's an opportunity for us to share those things we're going through, if we would like to, with our community of faith. It's an opportunity for us to share our joys and concerns. And one of the things we'll highlight a little bit later during our sermon time is that we are called to be unbound. God desires that we would be unbound, but we are called to unbind one another. And there is something about a community of faith where we are able to do that in a way that we wouldn't be able to otherwise. So if you have any joys or concerns you would like to share, we would most appreciate hearing them at this time. You can lift your hand and someone will bring you a microphone. Kathy and I would like to thank each and every one of you in the church for your prayers for Trey. On Wednesday uh, evening, he and his entire unit placed their uh, feet back on American soil. know that yesterday the CIA had their semi-annual, I don't know, twice a year yard sale. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, it was a successful sale once again. Thanks to all of you for your contributions and for some really hard work in VACs that came and helped us. Um, We raised $1,275 and that'll go back to the community. Um, Thanks to you all. Great. Other joys or concerns? All right, let's go to God in prayer together. God of all grace and all love and all peace and all mercy and kindness, we are grateful to pause in this moment knowing that we are here 
by your very gift. We thank you for your spirit which has drawn us here this morning and your spirit that is evident in the eyes of each one gathered. We thank you for the joys that have been celebrated, for the coming home of one who has put himself in harm's way for our freedom and our security and our protection, one who is willing to, like Jesus in many ways, go to any length to make sure that we are a part of this world in the way that you have called us to be. We thank you for the celebration of those who get up early in the morning and are, who are here week in and week out but come at least twice a year to make a contribution to this community, not just with the physical things that we provide, but also with your loving presence that is evident in each and every one of them. We thank you for this faith community that we call First Christian Church of Washington, the legacy that we have received, the gift that is ours, and for those who will come after us. We pray that as we always have, we will continue to be a beacon of your love and your hope and your peace, a place of respite, a place of sanctuary for those who are weary and heavy laden, that they, like we, will find rest in your Son, Jesus the Christ. And so, O oh God, it is now that we turn our attention to him and we look to his teachings and we look to his way of life and we look to the way that he responded to those in need and we thank you for the assurance and the trust that we have in him. We ask this morning, knowing that you are a God of compassion, that while we find peace in your acceptance, that you would break our hearts with what breaks your heart. When we see needless suffering and suffering of any kind, that we would do whatever it takes to be the healing presence that Jesus is in our lives and that we share with one another. We thank you for the power and the strength that comes from our faith in you. We thank you for the power and the strength that comes from the gift of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the power and the strength that comes through this community of faith. And we thank you for the power and strength that comes from prayer. Even the prayer that Christ taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. come to the time of the morning where 
is probably the most important reason we gather every Sunday, to meet at the table as a community, to drop all of our burdens down, and to open ourselves to the, the love that God has available for us. So we come to this table because it is not an invitation from this church or from me or from anybody, but it's God's invitation to anyone here, for all those who believe. So we ask that if you are here as a member or a guest, that you uh, feel, feel the welcome to accept the emblems that are passed out this morning. Please let us, uh, wait, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he went up to the upper room with his disciples, and he took the bread, and he broke it. And he passed it and said, this body, this bread is a representation of my broken body. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, and he poured it out and passed it and said, this is the spilt blood which represents a new covenant, and it represents my sacrifice to you. Whenever you gather, eat of this bread, drink of this cup, and do this in remembrance of me. The gifts of God for the people of God. Lord Jesus, we are honored to be at your table to share in communion with our church family. As we take of the bread representing your life and the cup representing your blood, we remember and celebrate your faithfulness to us and all who will receive you. Fill us today with your powerful spirit that we can share your message faithfully at every opportunity. In your precious name, amen.
May we all drink of the cup as one body. During our offering meditation this morning, I would like to read from Matthew, the sixth chapter, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And I'll read that again. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. My meditation for this morning is that we ask, where is our heart? There too is where our treasure should lie. Please take our treasures and use them to your will. Amen.
can believe this. I'm actually a pretty inhibited person by nature, but there are times when I hear them singing, I just want to say yes or something. I just want to express myself because you lift my spirit. So you all are so wonderful and we're so grateful for you. Thank you for being you and sharing your gift and the discipline each week and the joy that you bring. Certainly this service wouldn't be the same without you and we are so grateful for you. We are in our fourth week in our fourth sermon series um, as we move toward the cross and beyond the cross to resurrection. This is that time of Lent. For those of you who have been here each week, you know that this 40 days reflects that Jesus' time in the wilderness where he was praying, where he was contemplating, where he was getting very clear about his mission, where he was tempted, and certainly where he was empowered. And for those of you who would like to look at that story, I would recommend to you Luke chapter 4 where he is led out into the wilderness by the Spirit after his baptism, and then he was anointed beyond that, and he was very much empowered, he was very much equipped, and he was encouraged to fulfill the ministry that he had been called to. So this 40 days is for us also reflective of a time in the wilderness that we take intentionally. And this year we're looking at the reality that we are called to be in the process of becoming. We often think of it in terms of transformation, but it really is a process of becoming. And there's something that we need to remind ourselves of and we need to remind one another of on an ongoing basis, and that is that our true nature is that we are children of God. So let's remember that. If we don't remember anything else that's been said this morning, let's remember that our true nature is that we are children of God. Now, I know this is not something we normally do in a traditional service, but I'm going to encourage you to do this with me. I want us to say together, I am a child of God. Let's say that together. I am a child of God. That is our true nature, and we need to remind ourselves of that over and over and over again. We do have a human condition that is in tension with our true nature, but our condition is not what defines us. Our nature as children of God, created in God's image, that is what defines us. That is truly who we are. So this process of becoming is a process of growing into our true identity, growing into who we truly are. It is a time where we let go of those things intentionally. We let go of those things that are contrary to our true nature. And we claim those things that are consistent with our true nature. For the past several weeks, we've been looking at some familiar passages to all of us, and we try to look at them perhaps with fresh eyes and new eyes to glean some insights that perhaps we had not seen before. And this morning, I'm going to emphasize something a little bit different from the story of Lazarus than we are accustomed to considering. 
There is much that takes place in the passage, as I already indicated in the reading and as I was setting up the context, but what I want us to see is that we are called to unbind one another. We are called to unbind one another. This condition that we are all in, that is contrary to our true nature, keeps us bound in a number of ways. And Jesus, like he called to Lazarus, Jesus calls all of us to come out. Jesus calls all of us to rise up. Jesus calls all of us into new and empowered ways of living. And we are all called to respond to that call. And one of the ways that we do that, as you would expect a Christian minister to say, one of the ways that we do that is we first look to Jesus. We look to see Jesus as Jesus is. One of the first steps of this process of becoming unbound is when we look to Jesus as Jesus is. Because in so doing, and we're going to elaborate a little bit further than this statement that I often make, but I need to say again. When we look to Jesus, we see, number one, that God is. We see who God is. We see who we are, and we see who we are called to be. So if we are going to be unbound, one of the first things we need to do is look to Jesus. Now, many of you know, for those of you who have been here for months or weeks, and certainly those of you who have been here since I've been here, you know that I consider myself one of those big theological words, Christocentric. Christocentric, what does that mean? It means that I am very much Christ-centered. I really do believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I really do believe that Jesus is the one who embodied God's very presence. But I would submit to you, as much as I want to claim, and I do claim that we need to look to Jesus, we can also see the way of God, the presence of God, and other religious traditions. This past week, for those of you who are on social media and happen to be one of my friends, you saw that I posted something, and it was interesting because when I posted it, there was part of me that was a little bit concerned that people would take issue with it. For those of you who have seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Many of you have not. But I posted an interview with a person who lost his wife and his daughter due to the horrific incident that took place in New Zealand. Now, this person happens to be a Muslim, but he offered in this interview forgiveness and grace. And what I posted was that we as Christians could often learn a great deal from our Muslim brothers and sisters. We as Christians can learn a great deal about the love of God revealed in Jesus from other people. I do believe that Jesus is the full revelation. I believe more than any other person that has ever walked this world, Jesus embodies the presence of God. I believe that if we follow the teachings of Jesus, we are following the way to God. But I would submit to you as the more we learn about Jesus, the more we will see his way, the more we will see his teachings, the more we will see how he would respond in certain situations. And when one of our Muslim brothers and sisters says something, we can acknowledge that those truly are the words that would come from, from God, that they are consistent with Jesus. But for those of us within a Christian context, we can be certain that we can look to Jesus, and again, we will learn that God is, who God is, who are we, who we are called to be. So let's consider those aspects for just a moment. For some of us, if we are being honest with ourselves, we go through a period where we begin to question whether or not God really is. And I would submit to you that that's actually a healthy step in the journey of growing in our faithfulness of growing in our confidence and growing in our knowledge of God. It's okay to ask the question whether or not God even is. For some of us, we inherited our faith from our parents and our grandparents. We inherited our faith from a local church or an institution. And for many of us, we don't have the courage or we think that it's somehow wrong to ask the very question of whether or not God actually is. Again, I would submit to you it's okay to ask that question, and I'll share with you. That was a question that I began to ask late in my teens and early in my 20s if it had not been emerging before, and there was part of me that was afraid to even ask that question because are we to ask a question of God? It's okay to ask that question. In Jesus, we see that God really is. There were people who had inherited a faith tradition, a religious tradition. They began to see Jesus and the fact that God is, the reality that God is, was illuminated to them in new and powerful 
ways. Think of Nicodemus who approached Jesus at night. And he says, we know that you are from God. For some of us, it's okay to ask that question of whether or not God is. The next question that we can ask, and it's okay, is that what is the nature of Jesus' relationship with God? I went through a period where I was truly questioning this whole Christian thing and Christianity as a religion or as a way or a way to grow in our faith and the knowledge of God. And one of the questions I had early on was about the Trinity. How can Jesus be God and God be Jesus when God is by definition transcendent and infinite and to be human is by definition to be limited and finite? How do we reconcile these that Jesus and God are one? And if Jesus and God are one, then why does Jesus have to steal away? Why does he get, have to get away to a quiet place and pray to God? And further than that, if Jesus is God and God is Jesus, then who is Jesus talking to when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me on the cross? If Jesus is God and God is Jesus, who is he talking to? Many of us have questions like that. They're logical, reasonable questions that we don't have to shy away from. But I would also submit this to you. Just because we don't have all of our theological conundrums resolved doesn't mean that our faith journey has to stop. When I asked that question, personally, I asked that question of God. God gave me a response and an experience. It's not the experience itself, but the one who was experienced who settled the matter without answering the question. And this is what I mean. Paul often says, do not worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and supplication, present your request to God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He also, in the, the writer of Ephesians, says in chapter 3 that he prays that we will have the knowledge that surpasses knowledge of who Jesus is and, who God's, and what God's love is all about. This is what I'm trying to get you to see. There are times when we do not intellectually have all of our questions resolved, but we can have experiences with God that give us peace in the midst of our unanswered questions. Do you see that? Now, I'm not talking about anti-intellectual. I'm not talking about checking our minds at the doors when we come into a place of worship where we are called to worship the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. With all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We are to love God with all of our minds. We are called to ask the questions that would deeper our faith and deepen our understanding with recognizing, though, that God is someone who transcends our reason and our logic and our ability to comprehend. But as we look to Jesus, we do see that God is and who God is. In this passage, we see a number of elements of God that for us should be a presence of hope, a source of hope, a source of faith, a source of confidence, and a source of security in an otherwise insecure world. We learn very early on that we have no ultimate control over our lives, right? There are things that happen that are beyond our control. We can make our plans. We can do our best. We can try to live our right lives. We can try to be safe. But we know from the time we are, our eyes are open at some place in our own human and emotional and intellectual development that really and truly things are beyond our control. Not one of us, and I don't mean this as a scare tactic, because we're leading this to a place of security. Not one of us knows what the rest of this day holds. Not one of us knows what tomorrow holds. Not one of us has control over our own lives, much less of those things beyond our lives. But when we look to Jesus, this is the source of our hope. This is the source of our peace and assurance and confidence. This is the source of our ultimate security because we see in Jesus not just that God is, but who God is. There were some circumstances that he came upon where the people did not have a control over those circumstances. Lazarus, his life was cut short. The people who would have healed Lazarus if they could, could not do that. It was beyond their control. When Jesus enters the scene, he reveals one of the most important characteristics of God that we need to know about. It says that Jesus wept. Two words that are among the most powerful words in what we call Holy Scripture. Jesus wept. We know through this that if Jesus is the embodiment, Jesus is the very presence of God, if Jesus comes upon the scene and Jesus weeps out of compassion for God's children, 
that we know that God is a God of compassion. Whatever we go through, we do not go through alone. God is with us in everything that we go through. God is a God of compassion. God is not just a God of transcendence. God is not just a God of infinity. God is the God of the present, and not only the God of the present, but God is also a God of compassion. Whatever we go through, we do not go through alone. We can see that in who God is. Here's another thing that we can see. God did not cause all of those circumstances that God's children were enduring. God does not cause all things. I want us to be reminded of this. I want to remind myself of this. God does not cause all things. God did not cause Lazarus to be ill. God did not cause Lazarus' family and loved ones to suffer. But God can cause all things to work for good. Whatever we are going through, we can recognize that when there is pain, when there is suffering, when there is illness, God does not cause those things. God is a God of love. God would never do anything to intentionally hurt us. But we do know is God can take anything, something as horrific as a cross, and turn it into something good. Now, I know this is, for some of us, a theological point of controversy. It is my job to share with you my understanding of it. It is not your job to agree with me but I have a perspective that I feel called to share. For most of us, we are a part of the Protestant Reformation. Most of us are. And that has informed our understanding even of the cross without us even being aware of it. So I'm just going to submit to you my conviction about the cross that you are welcome to agree or disagree with. There are some people who think that God desired the cross because God needed the cross in order to forgive us of our sins. I don't see that. Jesus would encounter people, and he would say, go, your sins are forgiven you. This was before the cross. Jesus was someone who was on the cross who says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he was also the one who says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Jesus forgave before he ever sacrificed on the cross. God does not desire the cross. God does not desire our suffering. God desires perfect love. And Jesus' witness to perfect love is what had him crucified. God's mind was not changed about us because of the cross. God has always loved us. God will always love us. What was revealed on the cross is that even if you crucify God's son, God still loves us. There is nothing we are going to do that God will not love us. There is nothing we are going to do that God will not forgive us. We need to get that straight about God. For some of us, we live in fear that we are beyond God's love. For some of us, we live in fear that we are, we are beyond God's forgiveness. And in that regard, we need to be unbound. That is a form of bondage to live in this fear that God is going to get us. When the real nature of God is one of compassion and infinite love and grace and mercy. So we see that in the aspect of who God is. If we are going to be unbound, we are going to need one another. For some of us, at some place in our lives, and I know this was true of me, someone had to remove the stone from the tomb I was in. Someone had to unlock that prison that I was in. I did not have the power to come out at that point. It has required people, before I could ever hear Jesus say, come out. Before I could ever hear Jesus say, enter into a new way of life, it required other people removing that barrier that was between me and God. There have been people in my life, and I don't say that lightly. I was a mess, and I know you believe it. I was a mess. I had no God consciousness. But it was the people who reflected God's love to me that pulled that stone out of the way, that pulled that barrier out of the way. Humanly speaking, there were things that I had done that in my categories were beyond forgiveness, and I mean that. And there were people who loved me in ways that I didn't think possible that just transcended the categories of what I thought was possible so that those barriers would be removed so that I could experience the love of God. For all of us, we are called to be barrier removers. We are called to move that rock. We are called to move whatever stands between us and Jesus and the very ability to begin that process of becoming unbound. We need one another. There are things that you have been through that I have never been through, and one day I'll go through them, and I'm going to need you. 
There are some things that I've been through, even with my 46 years of life, that you haven't been through. And one of these days, you will go through it, and I'll be able to share with you. And that we all have different experiences where we can share with one another, and we can be there for one another. For some of us, we were bound in a particular way, and now we are unbound. For some of us, we were bound in another way, and now we are unbound. But together, we are in this process of becoming free. We need one another. I believe that we are called to intentional community, intentional community. And I didn't say church because oftentimes we have already some preconceived notions of what we mean by church. We are called to intentional community. What do I mean by that? We're called to intentional community in this. Yes, we do recognize that Jesus is the Christ at whatever level of understanding or experience we have at that point. Yes, we agree that Jesus is the Son of God at whatever degree of knowledge and experience and insight we have into that claim. Yes, we have in common that we recognize that Jesus is our Savior, our liberator in this context, setting us free to whatever degree we've experienced that, have knowledge of it and insight. That we also have in common. Beyond that, we need people in our community intentionally where we don't have everything in common. And that's one of the dangers, I believe, of the historical church beyond Jesus. Jesus came breaking down barriers between people. He came breaking down national barriers. He came breaking down economic barriers. He came breaking down traditional barriers in terms of a particular religious tradition or denomination. And for whatever reason, those of us who bear Jesus' name, we tend to be in enclaves that are very much alike one another, where we think the same way, we believe the same way, we see the world the same way. Our lives have been more or less influenced in the same way. By intentional community, what I mean is if we are going to be unbound, we need to enter into community with people who do not see the world exactly as we do. We need to enter into community with people who don't see Jesus the way we see Jesus. And if we can humble ourselves and realize that our experiences are limited and finite, we can recognize that when we do enter into these relationships, it is quite possible that people who have had experiences that are different than ours can complete our experiences. They can round them out, fulfill to a greater degree what we see of Jesus and who God is, and in some ways even correct it. There are some places that we may even err in our perspective of who God is, and in so entering into these relationships, we do become free. We are unbinding one another. And finally, this morning, I would share with you that one of the things that needs to be unbound, and this is the church's responsibility, is that we have the great challenge, the great honor, and yet, in some ways, the great difficulty of unbinding the Christian message itself. As a minister by vocation, but more importantly, as a person for whom Jesus is central to my identity, beyond my nationality, beyond my race, beyond any other sense of my identity, Jesus is foundational to my knowledge of who I am, what my purpose in this world is, what our purpose is collectively. But in our world, sometimes in the name of Christianity, I see a lot of hurt taking place. I see a lot of people who are excluded. I see heavier burdens being heaped on people, and I see people being placed further in bondage in the name of Jesus. I would submit to you that we as a community of faith are called to be a presence that unbinds people, unbinds people from fear, unbinds people from prejudice, unbinds people from racism, unbinds people from greed, unbinds people from violence, unbinds people from systems that they don't even know they're complicit in that are hurting other people. The gospel of Jesus, the message of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus is always, always, always one of love. It's always, always, always one of forgiveness. It's always, always, always one of mercy. It's always, always, always one of acceptance, just as God in Christ has accepted us. If we are going to be the presence of God in the world, if we are going to be free, One of the ways that we're going to have to do that is by unbinding this message that is not consistent with the message of Jesus. My prayer for us this morning is that we will recognize our true nature. We are children of God. 
and that we will be intentional with an urgency that whatever keeps us in bondage from growing into our true nature, that we would be diligent about those matters. My prayer for us this morning is that we as a community of faith will be committed to one another, that we will be in the process of unbinding one another from whatever would keep us in bondage. And if we want to know in a way that we can keep it fairly simple and yet infinitely profound, the degree to which we are in bondage is the degree to which we are incapable of loving God, loving ourselves, loving our neighbors, and even our enemies as God in Christ loves us. My prayer is that we will be unbound and that we will love God, we will love ourselves, we will love our neighbors and even our real and perceived enemies as God loves us with an infinite and unconditional love. Amen. If there's anyone here this morning who has never made a confession of faith, Jesus is the one who came proclaiming the way for us to be free free of fear, free of bondage, free of anxiety and worry and a lack of confidence. He is the one that can give us the assurance and meaning and purpose in our lives. It begins with the confession, and from that point on, it's a much wonderful and sometimes challenging process. If there's someone who is not a member of a community of faith, we are an intentional community where we are growing in the freedom, the freedom that comes from the love of God, and all of us have an opportunity to ask ourselves. Now hear this, I know I've been talking a lot, hear this. We can go through this season of Lent, and in four weeks we'll celebrate Easter, and no one's more excited about that than I am. But we can have an opportunity to ask ourselves, really, are we committed to this journey? Is this whole faith thing about transformation and becoming, or is it about something else? I submit to you that we have an opportunity, even today, to allow Christ, the light of the world, to shine into those dark recesses without fear of what will be discovered invite that light to come in so that we can become, so that we can grow, so that we too can reflect that light and freedom so that we can be free, so that we can love, and so that we can share that love that will set others free. So I encourage you to ask yourself, are you even on that journey? And if not, what step do you need to take? As I ask myself, what step do I need to take where I can be freer to love God, myself, my neighbors, and even my real or perceived enemies as God in Christ loves me? I invite you to stand as you're able as we respond as God is calling us to respond.
may the love of God that surpasses all understanding and comprehension, the love that will set us free from everything that would keep us in bondage, may that love guard and sustain our hearts this day and forevermore. Amen.